Good morning, everyone. Under Joe Biden, the world is less safe. Since stepping into the Oval Office, Joe Biden's weak foreign policy has been defined by a steady stream of disastrous decisions and a world in chaos as a result. His desperate policy of appeasement has left our nation and our allies vulnerable to attack. Make no mistake, Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine because Russia feared no reprisal from Joe Biden. Communist China flew a balloon over the United States and Joe Biden allowed it. And who can forget Joe Biden's catastrophic and botched Afghanistan withdrawal, abandoning American interests in the Middle East and resulting in 13 American lives lost, all under Joe Biden's watch. And now Israel, our most precious ally, is in the fight for her very survival, facing an onslaught of attacks on its borders from Hamas and now the unprecedented attack from Iran over the weekend. Russia, Communist China, and Iran have been emboldened by the utter failures of Joe Biden and the Biden administration. Our enemies do not fear recourse from America because of Joe Biden's weakness. For the sake of Israel's survival, our nation, and the world's security, we need to return to President Trump's peace through strength policies, which House Republicans proudly support. With that, we are joined by our Foreign Affairs Chairman, Mike McCall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, let me just say first, the, um, the world is on fire, and um, history will judge us by our actions. Uh, were you Chamberlain or were you Churchill? It all started with Afghanistan, the debacle, the implosion, the surrender to the Taliban that projected weakness, not strength. It invited aggression, not peace. What happened? Putin and the Russian Federation, we saw it on satellite imagery, going down to Ukraine to begin their invasion, and we warned them. I talked to the ambassador, our ambassador to Ukraine yesterday. Kharkiv is on the verge of falling. That's two million people. And the power grid could be taken down. It's a very dire situation in her words. China is more aggressive now than ever, threatening to take over Taiwan that controls 90% of our advanced semiconductor manufacturing for the world. And now the Ayatollah has raised his ugly head with his proxies his tentacles, and for the first time in history, unprecedented, an Iranian strike from Iran in Iran, uh, Israel itself, on Israel soil. How did we get here? By projecting weakness, not strength. Iran, not enforcing sanctions. Energy sanctions to the tune of $80 billion were essentially waived so that China could buy $80 billion of energy and fund Iran's terror enterprise. What else happened? The UN sanctions expired. We did nothing on, on the drones and the missiles, the very same drones and missiles that we saw launched last weekend, last Saturday night. The same missiles and drones that we know Mr. Putin is buying and killing the Ukrainians with as they build a manufacturing base in Russia itself. We need to go back to the maximum ca campaign, pressure campaign. We need to enforce these sanctions. We need to redesignate the Houthi rebels as a foreign terrorist uh, organization, for God's sakes. I don't understand this accommodation and, and appeasement to the Ayatollah in the hopes of some Iran deal when their own envoy, special envoy to Iran, is under FBI investigation for violations of his security clearance. You really can't make this up. The speaker has a plan. We're going to address Israel. We're going to address Ukraine. We're going to address Taiwan. And we're also going to have a fourth package with things like my Repo Act to help pay for this from Russian sovereign assets. We're going to have a loan program for direct uh, government payments creative ideas, a package that will be far better than the sentence. And I want to thank the speaker for his leadership in this very, very difficult time and very dangerous time. But the time clearly tacked is now. I'm uh, off to a um, hearing with Secretary Mayorkas. We'll be walking over articles of impeachment uh, today. We're going to demand the Senate do their constitutional responsibilities 
and hold a trial. This man is responsible for 200,000 people who are dead now because of fentanyls. This man is responsible for 350 on the terror watch list in this country now, posing a threat every day. Nine million encounters. He is responsible for releasing aggravated felons. In fact, in a memo, he told his agents, disregard Congress's law that says mandatory detention for aggravated felons, release them into society. We believe he merits impeachment. That is our message, and that is what we intend to do. And with that, I want to turn it over to our uh, whip, uh, Mr. Emmer. Iran's unprecedented attack against Israel this past weekend was a result of Joe Biden's disturbing pattern of appeasement on the world stage. Look no further than his failed foreign policy decisions over the last three years. In February 2021, Joe Biden reversed a Trump-era move which imposed permanent sanctions on Iran's drone and missile programs. In September of 2023, Joe Biden waived sanctions to give another $6 billion ransom payment to Iran. In November of 2023, Joe Biden handed another $10 billion to Iran, despite the repeated attacks against American servicemen overseas. And just this month, Joe Biden actually demanded that Israel back down in its fight against the Iranian-backed Hamas. It's no wonder Iran did not take Joe Biden's warning of don't very seriously. Robert Gates, who served as defense secretary under President Obama, hit the nail on the head when he said that Joe Biden has, quote, been wrong on nearly every major foreign policy and national security issue over the past four decades. Unfortunately, our allies continue to suffer and our adversaries continue to be empowered by this administration's incompetence. That is why this week our House Republican majority will be voting on a series of bills that hold Iran and its terrorist proxies accountable while showing our unwavering support for Israel. We cannot afford to equivocate on this issue. Now is a time for choosing, and the choice could not be more clear. It's a matter of uh, good versus evil, of right versus wrong. The question remains, will House Democrats let this administration's failed foreign policy slow walk us into World War III, or will they vote with House Republicans in putting a check on Joe Biden's incompetence? I hope that this week they're going to come to their senses and join us in standing with our strongest ally in the Middle East over Iran and its terrorist proxies. And with that, I turn it over to our leader, Steve Scalise. Thank you, Whip. With the world on fire, this is an incredibly difficult time for our allies around the world. You see what's happening in Israel. It's no longer just the terrorist proxies like Hamas that are trying to eviscerate Israel, but now you have Iran directly striking at Israel. You see what's happening in Ukraine with Putin taking advantage of the weakness here in the White House to try to reestablish the old Soviet Union. Uh, you watch what's happening in Taiwan as they look over their shoulder at China. We don't choose moments like this, but history will judge us based on how we respond to moments like this. That's why this week you're seeing the House deal with a number of pieces of legislation to first stand firmly with our friend and ally Israel to let them know that we have their back and their right to self-defense, however they choose to defend themselves from these unwarranted attacks from Iran. That's their choice, that's their decision, but we support that decision and we are gonna pass legislation to make that clear. We're also gonna be confronting the threat that Iran poses directly. It's no longer their proxies that they're working through. They directly took unprecedented action to launch strikes, drones, other missiles into Israel. Thank goodness for the coalition that joined together over the weekend. Uh, not just Israel, but the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Jordan, standing to make sure that we knocked all of those drones and missiles down so that you didn't have casualties in Israel. But what about the next potential strike? Uh, we know that Israel is contemplating a response. 
the president of the United States shouldn't be telling our ally that they shouldn't respond. Imagine if the United States was attacked on our soil and you had an ally call and say, don't respond. This is a time when your allies need to be standing together against evil in the world. There are dark forces out there and they're trying to do us harm and our friends harm. And this is the time where you stand with them. That's what the legislation this week we're bringing to the floor is focused on. Yesterday, I spoke with Prime Minister Netanyahu, and we know these aren't easy times. We meet with him a lot here, sometimes in Israel, but they're facing serious challenges that they haven't seen in decades. And we are going to be letting them know, as the whip said, it's a time for choosing. Everybody's going to have to pick a side this week. Do you stand with Israel or do you condone the terrorists and the largest state sponsor of terrorism, uh, Iran? I hope everybody chooses the side of Israel. We surely will be. And we're going to continue to stand up with our friends. And it's time the president stop putting preconditions on our allies and recognize when there's a choice between good and evil in the world, stand with good against evil. Israel is the country that we need to all be standing with. The man who's been leading that charge to stand with our allies, to stand up to the evil, and to push this administration in the right direction is our speaker, Mike Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Leader. Um, <clears throat> good to see everybody this morning. It's a big day on Capitol Hill, and we have been trying to push the administration to do their job. Let me say this very clearly, as you've heard me say so many times before, and you'll hear me say in the days ahead, the Biden border catastrophe remains the number one priority of the House Republicans. We have fought for this every single day. We will continue to fight for border security every single day. And today is a big day to bring some accountability. Um, it's a very important time in history, as has been noted here around the world, but certainly here as well. And we're all witnessing that, that we live in an increasingly dangerous world. And our enemies are growing increasingly hostile abroad, and they're trying to exploit our borders here at home. The administration has made that very easy to exploit. In fact, they put out the welcome mat, as we all know. And for the last uh, nearly four years, we've seen Secretary Mayorkas willfully cede operational control of our border to drug cartels. We've seen exploding numbers of terrorists be in, encountered at the border. We've seen uh, gang members and people with criminal backgrounds be released into our country. We've seen fentanyl flood over the border. And it's now become, as we all know, the leading cause of deaths for Americans age 18 to 49. It feels like almost every day we hear another story now of violence committed against innocent Americans, some illegal alien who commits a violent act, assaults, brutalizes, or even murders uh, an American. We're, we're hearing about um, illegal aliens getting, getting busted for trafficking drugs in, our, in our, even our small towns. And Secretary Mayorkas has invited this catastrophe into our cities and our states, and he is responsible for the heartache of so many families across this country. He and Joe Biden engineered this catastrophe. They allowed it. They apparently desired it. And now we're all living with the uh, results of it. He has repeatedly violated the public trust in a way that no previous cabinet secretary in the history of the United States has. And he has willfully defied federal immigration laws, willfully defied the will of Congress, the bipartisan will of Congress, bipartisan laws that were enacted before he took office and since. And after the House transmits the articles of impeachment to the Senate later today, we expect and we demand that all 100 senators listen to the arguments of the House impeachment managers. They have a constitutional and institutional obligation to do so. If Senator Schumer cares at all about the suffering of Americans and the disaster that Mayorkas has wrought at the border, then he will hold a full and public trial. The American people want a full and public trial. I think they deserve to see the evidence, and it will be unconscionable, and I, in my view, unconstitutional if Chuck Schumer fails in that responsibility. We have fought every single day to secure the border. The accountability for Secretary Mayorkas is a long time coming, but obviously there's much, much more to do. We passed H.R. 2, as everybody knows, a long time ago, and it had all the key provisions to secure that border. We, we say H.R. 2 as if everybody understands what it is, but some Americans may not. What did we do in that bill? Very important things. We would, we would restore the Remain in Mexico policy that the previous administration under Donald Trump used to, to secure the border. We would end the catch and release policy that President Obama first installed and Joe Biden uh, reenacted. We would end the abuses of the 
parole system and the, uh, the abuses uh, of our, our asylum uh, process and systems that has allowed all of this flood of people into our country and even these dangerous criminals. We, we also would rebuild parts of the wall because if we, as we've shown in Texas and demonstrated elsewhere, that's a critical deterrent to people crossing illegally. That was H.R. 2. We sent it to the Senate, and it has been sitting on Chuck Schumer's desk ever since. Since that time, we passed resolutions in favor of the border. We'll continue, the House Republicans will continue to push all of this legislation through the House and use every ounce of leverage that we have to get control of the border. I have begged and pleaded and demanded that the President use his executive authority that he clearly has under law. Section 212F of the Immigration and Nationality Act that now everybody knows by heart allows the President full discretion to close the border entirely, to shut it down if he deems it to be in the nation's interest. For goodness sakes, if this is not the time where it's in the nation's interest, we don't know when it would be. FBI Director Chris Ray has testified multiple times on the Hill and most recently here just several days ago that all the lights are blinking. We expect and anticipate a terrorist attack on the homeland because we've allowed over 340 persons, suspects on the terrorist watch list, they were apprehended at the border, but we've allowed many of their compatriots, none of us knows how many, to come through unevaded or to be in those groups of gotaways. We know that there are uh, single adult men, which is the vast majority of the people in, in some of these sectors that have come in. When we took uh, 40 or 64 Republicans to the uh, to the Eagle Pass sector, uh, the Del Rio sector back on January, January 3rd, largest congressional trip ever. They told us that 60 to 70 percent of the crossings at that border at that time were single adult males of military age and capability. What are they plotting? What are they planning? Where are they? What small town are they encamped in? We have no idea, but we anticipate the worst. We pray for the best. We pray that all these fears are not realized, but this is a serious, serious thing to the American people. And so I, uh, I, I put out a, uh, a preliminary plan, uh, as you all know, on these, these uh, measures to handle these, these matters from Israel to Ukraine to uh, the Indo-Pacific region. And the fourth bill in this package would be our priorities, which is the Repo Act, and we implement the loan concept and all of this in the supplemental uh, discussion. Uh, but the will of, this, of our body is to find every possible way using this legislation and every legislation that we pass to try to use as leverage to get the administration to get control of that border. The American people demand it. The American people deserve it. We're going to continue those discussions today um, about the, the bill. Um, it's in draft form. It's not been released yet because they're still working it out. We have lots of ideas on the table, and we'll be, uh, we'll be doing that in earnest, and, um, and I'll take a few questions. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Front row. Uh, I am not resigning, and it is, um, it is, in my view, an absurd notion that someone would bring a vacate motion when we are simply here trying to do our jobs. Um, it is not helpful to the cause. It is not helpful to the country. It has not helped the House Republicans advance our agenda, which is in the best interest of the American people here, a secure border, uh, sound governance. Uh, and it's not helpful to the unity that we have in, in the body. Look, we have, a, we have a very important mission here. Our mission is very clear. The reason most of us, and I can speak for the House Republicans, the reason every House Republican ran for Congress is they, they, because they wanted to come here and help to save this beleaguered republic of ours. We want to save the country. We believe that we're in an existential moment. We really do. This is a civilizational moment. It's a, uh, it, it's a moment where we're going to decide in this election cycle which vision we have for the country. See, we believe, and you all have heard me say before, we believe in the founding principles, the foundations of America, things like individual freedom and limited government and the rule of law and peace through strength and fiscal responsibility and free markets and human dignity, the foundational, the anchor points that, that make us the exceptional nation that we are. And, and right now we're in, a, we're in a, a political struggle, a battle between a completely different vision for the country. We, we have colleagues in the Congress who envision for us not those things. They have disdain for those things I just listed. They instead envision that America should be remade in the form of some sort of, you know, European-style socialist utopia. That is a dangerous fool's errand. That is a road to Marxism, communism, you know, socialism. That's a step towards those eventualities, and that is not who we are as a country. And so for us to accomplish our mission, which is to save the republic, we need to add more Republicans to the House and grow the House majority so we have more votes. We need to, we need to win back 
the Republican majority in the Senate, and we need to restore Donald, Donald J. Trump to the White House as our nominee. I believe all those things will happen, but we have to we have to have a united front, and we have to have our members work together, and we'll be we'll be working today uh, to do that very thing. Um, look, we are in we are in unprecedented times. Okay, um, we're in dangerous times, as has been articulated here around the world and here at home. We need steady leadership. We need steady hands at the wheel. I, look, I regard myself as a as a wartime speaker. I mean, in a literal sense, we are. I knew that when I took the gavel. I didn't anticipate that this would be an easy path. The former Speaker Newt Gingrich posted a couple days ago on his social media that um, this is the hardest challenge that's faced a speaker probably in the history of the country, in the moment that we're in right now. He said arguably uh, may be comparable to the Civil War, but maybe worse. A single vote margin at a difficult time when the nation is terribly divided. The way we get through that is we show unity and we explain how we have answers to all these great challenges. We have those answers. We shouldn't get in the way of ourselves. We're, we're going we're gonna to work this out today, and we'll have a lot more comment for you today, uh, for you later. But um, I'm going to tell you that I am not concerned about this. I am going to do my job, and I think that's what the American people expect of us. Thanks so much.